Even though the chances of you seeing someone performing an oxymercuration reaction in the modern lab are somewhat lower than your chances of meeting a live dinosaur in the next time you poke your nose outside, this reaction is a must-know for any organic chemistry student and it is definitely going to be on your next exam. So today I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about this reaction and probably a little bit more. Hey everyone, my name is Victor and I help students excel in organic chemistry by explaining difficult concepts in a clear and straightforward way. So grab a cup of coffee and notebook to work through examples with me and let's get started! As always, we are going to start with a simplified mechanism of this reaction. This reaction consists of two distinct phases. In the first phase, we are going to react our alkene with mercury. This step is very similar mechanistically to the halogenation of the alkene step. So here, the double bond is going to serve as my nucleophile, providing the electron density towards the mercury, one of the acetates going to drop off and then mercury is going to reattack one of the carbons of the double bond. We are not showing any electron pairs on the mercury because those are going to be D electrons and it is a little bit of a blasphemy to show D electrons, but trust me, they're there. So we are going to be showing the uh, reaction just like that, starting our arrow from mercury and not from the electron pair like we normally do. As a result of this electrophilic attack on our double bond, we are going to form a mercury mercuric ion, which is sometimes also referred as a mercurinium ion, those are synonymous to each other and both terms are perfectly fine. We are also going to form some of the free-floating acetate and just like in the case with the halogenation or oxyhalogenation and all of those reactions, the concentration of our acetate is going to be somewhat low here, so since we are going to be doing this reaction in excess of water because we are working in the aqueous solution, we are going to have water as our primary nucleophile opening our mercuric ion. So when water attacks here, and it is going to be attacking the more substituted carbon, like we would expect for any intermediate of that sort, the electrons will go back onto the mercury, and in this case we are going to end up making a new carbon-oxygen bond. And just like in the case of, let's say, oxyhalogenation reaction, we are going to end up with a protonated intermediate, which we are naturally going to be deprotonating with another equivalent of water or another equivalent of acetate floating around, so you can choose either or. Some textbooks prefer to use water, some textbooks and instructors prefer to use acetate ion, so same difference for our purposes here. So the proton of our protonated intermediate going to fall off and we are going to get the final product of this first step, which going to look something like this. Now, nobody in their right mind will ever try to isolate this intermediate because mercury organic compounds are in incredibly toxic, which means that we are going to work it up immediately while it is still in the reaction mixture. So once we get this intermediate, we are going to do the last step in this reaction, which is going to be reduction. And that reduction is typically performed by sodium borohydride, NaBH4, in basic media. This step is also sometimes referred to as demercuration reaction, so this reaction can be called either uh, oxymercuration reduction, or some instructors refer to that as oxymercuration demercuration reaction, which for our purposes is exactly the same thing. Typically, most instructors will not ask you to draw the mechanism for that last step, but if your instructor does, usually we give students the simplified version of that mechanism, where the hydride ion from the borohydride drops onto a carbon, which causes a cascade of the electron density like this, and as a result, you're going to end up with an alcohol. We're also going to have another free-floating acetate ion floating around, and we are going to have mercury as a free metal dropping down in little pretty looking droplets. Just don't play with those with your hands because they're still quite poisonous. Now, while mercury zero, just metallic mercury, is not any 
anywhere close to being as poisonous as organomercury compounds, they're still not necessarily a Christmas present, and there is a whole long and complicated procedure that you need to follow to get rid of that mercury, so nowadays people try to avoid this type of chemistry as much as possible, and there are other methods that have been developed that accomplish the same, but without the use of mercury, and they're significantly less toxic. However, within the scope of the sophomore organic chemistry, we're not covering those methods, and we still teach organomercury uh, chemistry like this, although it's a little bit archaic. But I digress. Let's look at the actual example. So here is a reaction between my favorite one methyl cyclohexene and mercury in this oxymercuration reaction. We are going to start by quickly going through the mechanism of this reaction. In the first step, we are going to have the electrophilic attack by mercury on the alkene, so the electrons from alkene going to go to mercury, one of the acetates is going to fall off, and mercury is going to back attack one of our carbons, so we can create a three-membered ring with the mercury, which going to look like this. I am also going to form a corresponding enantiomer, because mercury can attack from either front face or the back face, here in this case I show the example where mercury is attacking from the back face of our molecule, so the front face is going to be the one where mercury is looking at us and the methyl group is looking away from us. We are also going to have the water floating around and we have the acetate ion that is floating around as, as well. Oh, and by the way, uh, in case you didn't know, the acetate is this species over here, COOCH three with a minus, so this part of the molecule is abbreviated as acetate, we organic chemists are incredibly lazy breed, so we like to abbreviate anything as much as possible. So instead of writing CH3COO minus, we are writing ACO minus because you know it's a couple of letters shorter, so of course we are going to do that. Anyways, jokes aside, acetate is a very common ion here and it is a very common abbreviation, so it's a very good one to know just for the future reference. So from this point on, my next step is going to be the nucleophilic attack by water, and we know that whenever we have this three-membered ring, like I have here, I have a three-membered ring with an X with a plus, and I've mentioned in my previous video that it doesn't matter what exactly that X is. It can be a halide, it can be an oxygen atom, it can be mercury, like in this case, doesn't matter, for as long as it is a three-membered ring with an X with a plus, we're always going to be opening that from the more substituted side. So if I analyze my three Remember, ring, I have my atom number one and atom number two, so atom number one here is a more substituted carbon, so I'm going to be attacking that guy, so my water is going to attack there, and electrons are going to go back onto the mercury, opening this mercuric ion, giving me the corresponding protonated intermediate, plus the corresponding enantiomer, of course. And so the next step here is going to be either using our acetate that is floating around, or another equivalent of water to deprotonate my intermediate and give me a neutral intermediate. So in this case, I will show that acetate comes in, pulls that proton off, and I'm going to end up with a neutral next molecule. That going to look like this. And finally, I'm going to bring in my sodium borohydride, so I have HBA4-, where I have my formal charge on the boron, and of course I have sodium as the counter ion floating around, minding its own business, not doing particularly much. Here, I'm going to have the hydride attacking the carbon, electrons move onto the mercury, from there onto the acetate, and as I've mentioned a moment ago, this is a shortcut, it's not quite the real mechanism, but that's the way we generally teach this mechanism, so that's what I'm going to be showing here. And my final product will look just like that here. If you wrote plus enantiomer just on autopilot, you would be incorrect, so hopefully I did not catch you on that, because this carbon over here is not chiral, which means that we are not going to be forming any enantiomers or anything of that sort. Be always very careful with the stereochemistry of your products. Don't just write plus enantiomer or plus diastereomer on autopilot. This is a very common trick on the exams, and I can guarantee your instructor will try to catch you on that, so always double-check what exactly you've made, and if you still have chiral atoms there or not. So write about 
about now, you might be wondering, why bother with this reaction at all? Mercury is highly toxic. This reaction requires an extra step to knock off the mercury from the molecule. Why don't we just do a you know, simple hydration reaction? Well, there is a reason. And that reason is not because organic chemists are slightly masochistic and like making their life more difficult. No, 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 no. The reason is that this reaction unlike a simple hydration, does not form any carbocationic intermediates and, therefore, does not suffer from the carbocation rearrangements. Let me illustrate that with an example. Say I have this reaction in front of me and I were to do just a simple hydration reaction. So step number one is going to be the formation of the corresponding carbocation, which in this case is going to be a secondary carbocation right next to a tertiary position. So that secondary carbocation is going to immediately undergo carbocation rearrangement via the hydride shift, giving me a more stable tertiary carbocation, which, when we follow through the mechanistic steps of this reaction, going to give me the final product, which going to look like this. While I am not showing the complete mechanism for this reaction here, I do encourage you to show every single step and show all the electron movements for the practice sake so you know how exactly it works and you review that reaction to make sure that you can do that during the exam. Now, let's compare the reaction above with a similar reaction where I have the same starting material, but instead of a simple hydration, I'm going to do the oxymercuration reaction. Well, in this case, if I follow through all of my mechanistic steps, the product that I'm going to get will look like this, where my OH is at the secondary carbon. So there is no rearrangement in this case, because there is no carbocation intermediate. Also, the important thing that I want to point out about this particular reaction, that the carbon where my oxygen is sitting, that is, in fact, a chiral carbon, which means that we are going to end up with a pair of enantiomers for this particular product. It's going to be a racemic mixture. And when it comes to the stereochemistry of this reaction, it is not stereospecific overall. Well, the first step in which we form the mercuric ion and then open it is, in fact, stereospecific and will always make an intermediate with the mercury and OH looking at the opposite directions, the second step in this reaction, where we are getting rid of our mercury, the reduction with sodium borohydride, is not stereospecific, rendering the entire reaction non-stereospecific. So, if you end up making one or more chiral atoms in your molecule, you will have all possible combinations of those stereocenters. So, for instance, if I were to take this as a starting material and were to do the oxymercuration reduction in this case, then the product that I would get would look like this. In this case, I have one and another one, I have two chiral atoms, which means that I'm going to end up with a mixture of four stereoisomers. So, what do you think about the oxymercuration reaction? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Is it something in between? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you for watching this video till the very end. I want to especially thank all the Organic Chemistry Tutor members and my generous donors. I upload new videos every single day and this would not be possible without your help and encouragement. If you learned something new today, please give this video a like and leave a comment below so that YouTube algorithm will promote this video and show it to more people. In the meantime, watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow!